Seven questions about the RIA model Michael Kitsis has never been asked. That is today's topic of the transition to RIA question and answer series. It is episode number 100. Hi, I'm Brad Wales with Transition to RIA, where I help you understand everything there is to know about why and how to transition to the RIA model. If you're not already there, if you head on over to transitiontoria.com, uh, you can find all of the resources I make available from this entire series in video format, podcast format. I have articles, I have white papers, all kinds of things to help you understand the RIA model. Again, transitiontoria.com. Okay, with that, this is episode number 100, uh, and that milestone deserves a, a, a fun and exciting show. So for those of you watching on video, you can see we have a guest today, is Mr. Michael Kitsis. Michael, thank you for coming on. I appreciate the opportunity. Congratulations. 100 episodes is an awesome milestone, Brad. Yeah, thank you. I, I uh, appreciate that, and, and, and you've probably quoted the stats. You know, unfortunately, a lot of podcasts and shows, I think they... The average one doesn't get past like seven or whatnot. And so yep. uh, I'd like to think if I could get to 50, I could get to 100 and, and we'll, we'll we'll see how far that goes. But uh, but I appreciate you uh, participating Absolutely. here in episode 100. And I think we're gonna have a fun one here. So yeah. when I reached out to Michael, I said, hey, I got episode number 100. Love to have you on. Love to talk about the RA model. Well, the reality is Michael gets interviewed hundreds of times and probably hears a lot of the same questions. So I challenged him and I said, hey, I'd like you to come on if you if you uh, agree to it. And I have put together what I believe are seven questions about the RA model you have never been asked before. Whoa. Are you up for the challenge? And so I ask you, sir, are you up for the uh, hot seat today? I'm up for the hot seat. I'm terribly curious what's coming because, like, no joke for anyone who's listening. Like, he has not told me this is not like a rehearsed spiel. I really have no idea what's coming here. Yeah, so, sure, let's dive in. Let's see. Uh -huh. So what, uh, and he's absolutely right, no no, no answer or no questions given ahead of time. And if you could, Michael, if you got a pen or something, and don't tell me as we go, but make a note as we go through, and let's see okay. if I, at the end, if I got, I, I'm, I'm feeling good about seven for seven. We'll, we'll see how it plays okay. out, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm feeling good about it. So with, okay. with the first one, the first question uh, to put Michael on the hot seat with, uh, I don't know about your neck of the woods of the country, but down here in Florida, where I am, people are crazy about Chick-fil-A. People love Chick-fil-A. They will roll up to the drive-thru. There's 42 people in line. They roll up and they say, I'm happy to be the 43rd person in line. And they will literally wait for that. I, I think it's wild. Uh, but, but there's such a love with Chick-fil-A. Uh, and you got to give credit for Chick-fil-A because not only do they have that crazy demand from customers, they have crazy demand from franchise owners that want to have a yes. Chick-fil-A franchise. So with that context, will we ever see, maybe you feel it already exists, I, I, I don't believe it does to the, to the extreme of Chick-fil-A, but will we ever see the Chick-fil-A of our industry? The Chick, so like the 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 chain, the fran, like the chain franchise of our industry? No, just the the such raven, passionate customers that are willing to, in this case of Chick Fil A, stay in. Uh, literally, if you ever go by a busy Chick Fil A and, and it's circled around the building twice, I think that's crazy. But they are such raven clients. So in our in our world, that would be the the investor clients that need help, and then they also have the business owners that want to own a franchise. The equivalent okay. is yeah. an advisor that says, "Well, I not only do I hope they reach out to me, I hope I can get an opportunity there." Will we ever see such raven interest on both sides with a particular firm oh i you know my my like my heart of the industry wants to say yes my like pragmatic realist i'm i'm not sure i i i i worry we might not we might never quite get there and 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 the reason like now I feel like I have to qualify that because that's like a slightly depressing answer to me. <laughs> um, look, Chick-fil-A is successful as a franchise because there's a standard way of doing things, right? Everything's a system and a process. They've got the whole thing buttoned down. So basically you just, you know, they can teach the franchisees how to do it. Here's the game plan. Execute this roadmap. It will work exactly this way. And then the parent company builds such a wonderful brand around the country that, like, you know, you're going to get that experience no matter where you go. 
and and off you go and off you go with that experience and look like it's such it's so specialized to me the irony on the flip side i know at least one advisor whose niche is chick-fil-a franchise <laughs> operators uh shout out to the panda wealth folks so right it's so standardized they actually made a business out of serving the people that do it here's the part that i struggle with when i think about this from an advisory firm perspective we are at its core a service business right you show up we do things and we do knowledge work i'm not and i don't mean this in negative but like we're not just preparing food we're not just making widgets we're not just shipping down something down the line there's a level of of knowledge work and service that goes into this that means in in the best case scenario i guess i'll frame it this way like in the best case scenario I don't know how someone can make that trick fillet equivalent in our industry without it taking literally 20 to 30 years. For the simple reason that every single advisor at every single location has to get trained in not just being a financial advisor, but like their way of being an advisor, doing things with their particular systems and structure and process, trained in it, executed it, delivering it, multiplied across a zillion other advisors at other franchise locations doing the same thing to me just that there's a there's a scale in training challenge to that that i think is very difficult in just in such a knowledge worker based industry as ours that feels a little bit different than food service industry or or a manufacturing kind of world at the at best you can't build that quickly you have to build it slowly to bring in all the people that 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 want to be part of that, that want to learn your way of being the 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 Chick Fil A advisor way of being an advisor, and for better or worse, like I, I you know most of us who get into this business, we do it because we want to serve clients. We don't do it because we want to build the nationalized training system yep. for serving clients. And like, if you're that person out there, like business idea opportunity, I don't know, call me, we can figure something out. Ah, uh, because I do see opportunities in that, but. This, that whole nature, that is a really different thing. Like how to build a nationalized mo- training model to help all advisors advise in a certain way that that consumers will love. And then finding the advisors who actually want to do it and learn it. That's like a whole other level of challenge. Yeah. So maybe uh, even if the heart is in the right place, culture is in the right place, the logistics just might be too hard to overcome to, to that. Yeah. Degree. I mean, just it's, it's, you know, that's a heck of a scaling challenge right just like cool idea can you teach a thousand advisors to do it and stick with you can you train five thousand advisors to do that and stick with you and 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 follow the system and just i don't i don't know i don't know if we can quite figure out how to how to build and hold human systems together like at that level in in the financial advisor world you know the asterisk i would give from the flip side like you can also have a wonderfully wildly successful business with 50 great clients. So I, there's also part of me that's like, what entrepreneur is insane enough to actually want to inflict that upon themselves to build? Because you can have like a wildly successful practice that uh, will feed your family and your kids and your grandkids for a few generations without doing anything near that size and scale. Yeah. Uh, but just there, there's a level of, scaling humans at national scale that we're already seeing a few firms that are trying to do this, right? Like the Peter Malukes and Ron Carson's of the world. Uh, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And as, as big as those firms are, you take someone outside of our industry, I would argue not, only a small part of the population could recognize their name kind of thing where everyone well, of course knows who chick fil is, you know? Well, yeah. You know, as, as, as much as like, Folks, firms like Peter Maluk are, are are talked about for how big they've created planning has gotten with. I think they're like two hundred billion dollars under management now, or something like. It's cool, they're one tenth the size of one wirehouse. Yeah, I think Merrill and Morgan each each have more than two trillion dollars, and then there's Wells, and then there's UBS. So, like our largest of mega 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 RAs in our world, like we're still like tiny compared to national wirehouses like oh and merrill lynch and morgan stanley those are all firms that have like low single digit market share yeah yeah and no, keep... and they're 10 20 x the size of mega mega rias so just you know, the uh, the the 
the pool is so big, so like unimaginably large when you try to start wrapping your head around how big our space really is. Um, and it's, and I think it's that fractured and diverse because humans are wonderfully varied people. We all want our different things and what we want to do and how we want to serve clients. And to me, basically like the whole growth of the independence movement is because most of us don't actually really want to be widgets in someone else's planning system. Yeah. We want our thing our way for our clients, which is like wonderful for clients to have served, be served and have choices, but it also makes it really hard to make the national Chick-fil-A franchise of financial advisors. Yeah. So we will, we will see. I, I would, I would agree with you. It would be extraordinarily hard. I, I guess the only thing I'd say, never, never say never, right? 30 years ago, if you said, Hey, there's going to be a chicken restaurant that people will wrap the building around for a basic chicken sandwich. We probably wouldn't think that uh -huh. was possible either. And, and here they are. So yeah, I'm very careful. I'm not, I'm not going to say never. There are things I will say never to, but like, mm -hmm. I ain't saying never to that, yeah. but very, uh, hard. very hard. But you yeah, yeah. just, the uh, even the mega firms in our industry don't have a great track record at trying to turn advisors into widgets, which, and I don't mean in the negative way, but like, that's how businesses that do that kind of national franchising work. I mean, like the whole point of franchising is we boil this down to a systematized process, just buy all the things and it works. And that's not how we like to show up as advisors. Yep. 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 Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, you kind of gave me a little lead in to number two. Okay. You made a, you made kind of a reference to this. So a couple of these, or hypotheticals that you got to kind of take your Michael Kitts's hat off. I know you got your, your hands okay. and all these things. So, so it wouldn't actually happen. But the, the second question is, again, if this wasn't a capacity issue, uh, your this was not a money issue. What could, what could maybe be the most lucrative? This is a satisfaction question that if you okay. had to, if you could instantly be put in charge of either a 50 million RIA, a 500 million RIA, or a 5 billion RIA. It's your job to run it. Which one do you choose? Like for literally me personally? Yeah, yeah. So this is not, hey, we're going to make the best economics. This is satisfaction. Which one do you think you would enjoy the most and why? Um, I, well... I basically go back and forth between these two bookends because I've essentially lived back and forth between these two these two bookends. So I I spent about 10 years very consciously running our plat kids' platform as like the equivalent of a $50 million high income lifestyle practice. Uh I never had more than one or two team members. Uh I drove a huge amount of revenue, almost all of it dropped to the bottom line. I had, you know, all the flexibility and control to do all the things that I wanted to do. Uh, and it was phenomenally lucrative. Then I got a little hungry to have more impact because ultimately I'm one of those like impact people. Um, I drive the same crappy car for 16 years and haven't moved and I buy the same shirt 12 at a time. So like, I don't really have a lot to do with a high income practice. I just like bank the money and don't know what to do with it. Uh and so I'm 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 impact driven, which is why I made a conscious shift to several years ago to say, no, 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 I want to really make this bigger and and grow a team. And so now we're you know by, by the time this airs, we'll be a 25 person team, which means I I I basically run the team of what a lot of billion dollar RAs run, and we're growing very fast from here. And so I'm living that larger firm scaling up environment as well, and it's just different. Like the, it's different in what drives the satisfaction, right? The $50 million practice satisfaction was I make a really good income. I have complete control over my time and hours. I can balance it however I want between how much I work and how much time I spend with my kids. So I had very young ones at the time. Um, and I make what it really amounts to like a really, really good dollar per hour. Growing and scaling a larger thing, like, I don't do anything I used to do anymore. I don't write as much content as I used to. I don't speak as much as I used to. I don't see clients as much as I used to. I spend my time running and managing a growing enterprise. And I'm mostly in the people finding and people development and system building business, which is just a very fundamentally different job than it was when I ran a high income solo practice. And so I'm a little bit weird in that I've done both bookends of this. And I mean, if you, if I put on the hat of 
XY Planning Network and Advice Pay and all the other companies I'm involved with, you know, in the aggregate, I've got about 170 team members across five or six different businesses, not including our advisory firm where I, I joined later. I didn't make that. Uh, uh, and it's just such a different job and driver. It's like I have found both satisfying, but for very, very different reasons. And they were both satisfying for me because I wanted different things to be satisfied at different stages of my own career. Uh, I will say the one that's probably the most challenging on that list is the one in between because you're too big to be small and too small to be big. And, and, and that's a tough spot. You know, having, having done multiple businesses now over the years that I've grown up to many millions of dollars of revenue uh, for, for each business there is a particular challenge point that comes in most businesses when you get above six or seven team members and you're not yet above 20. That's just a super messy middle. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. You don't really have a full management team infrastructure to do it. You don't have all your leaders in place. You don't have department leaders and directors and managers who can manage teams. Your org chart still kind of looks like a starfish where everything sprawls off you, but there's way too many people for you to actually manage. You're trying to delegate some things, but the people you're delegating to are mostly doers, not managers. So they're not good when the organization gets more complex. And just there's a lot of messiness in that middle that I can say, like, it doesn't get easy, but there are some things that get easier once you get north of about 20 to 25 team members, because you just get to a certain stability point where you've got all the teams and department structures in place and a, and a leadership infrastructure. So I will say the messiest is the one in the middle. I don't know very many people that are happy to stay at the one in the middle, but I was very, very happy in the equivalent of the $50 million lifestyle practice for a decade. I did ultimately move at least in the direction of the proverbial 5 billion RA. We're not that big by team yet. Uh, on the kits ascend, we are by, you know, all the things that I'm involved with, but it's satisfying in a very, very different way that if that's not what checks the satisfaction box for you, you, you probably wouldn't actually enjoy it uh, because it, it takes you away from clients and a lot of the reasons why a lot of us get into the business in the first place. Yeah, I know you've talked a lot about that messy middle and, and you know, how the, unfortunately the word lifestyle practice sometimes is used in a derogative manner. But no, the reality is, as you said, you can have a wonderful practice, both economics and and, and life yeah. balance with, with 50 we, million or 50 clients, 50 good clients. Yeah. And uh, not not everyone has to yeah. push push higher up the chart. Well, and, I mean, we 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 run a I mean, we so a part of the kids platform, we run an advisor well-being study. And, and I can tell you like directly from the numbers, the people who actually say they're happiest when you get down to who says they're happy and enjoying their life, it's the $50 million people. Okay. It's not the bigger firm folks. Okay. Uh, uh, we see more happiness in the small firms. Now, not very small. There comes a point where you're doing too much work for too few clients for too little money to use the, the old Bill Backrack phrase. And, and that's not happy. The, the, the folks we see that are really happy are like 30 to $50 million practices, 30 to 50 clients, because they're all million dollar plus a piece. They make hundreds of thousands of dollars. They've got a few dozen clients. It does not take that much time. Yeah. They work 30 hours a week or less, making many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars, supported by probably one person, maybe two, if they really want to staff up a little more. Like it's a three person team. They're netting a huge portion of their income. They don't spend a lot of time at work because they uh, make a great income and don't have a lot of clients. And they could grow further. Like it's not like they're for really half-assing their work. They're providing a high, very high value to a very limited number of clients. So when that adds up to the amount of money you need to achieve all your goals, why would you work more hours? Yep. Yep. No, and, and that's why I said I. I hate when the kind of term is used, you know, as derogative as if, oh, that's someone just not capable of growing there, but people strategically prefer that. So, uh, yeah, great point. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll a lot of them, the, the ones, the irony I would find, like the ones that really run lifestyle practices are so intentional about their growth. Like uh, 
All the people I've met who run really good lifestyle practices, I truly believe are capable of building billion dollar firms because they have the mindset of intentional building that it takes to build that way. They've chosen not to because they make more money with less work doing what they're doing, what they're what they're doing. Yeah. The folks I find are unhappy are not good at being really focused about what they're doing in their practices and they accrue clients to become hundreds of millions of dollars and maybe get to a billion someday, but they didn't have a clear growth focus of what they were doing. And so it's really, really messy getting there. And some of them stall out after two or three or $400 million because it gets so messy. The people who make really strongly structured high income lifestyle practices do it with the intentionality that you would need to make a billion dollar firm. They just actually figure out they'll make more money with less stress by not doing it. Yeah. You get, and you and I mean, it. I can, I can attest that like I, my take home was better with two team members than with 25. Yeah. I have a bigger business. Top line revenue is a lot bigger, but yeah. you have to do so much to invest in the business, especially when you're growing fast. Like my economic net worth would have been better staying small because that thing was really high margin. Well, self selfishly, we appreciate you uh, growing because that's expanded the team and expanded the content. So uh, put put a vote down for thanks for going. Uh, I'm not stopping up. now. I'm I, oh, you can't I am stop it now. It's the it, it, <laughs> it's in motion. So all right, uh, number three. This is uh, a question, but with a little twist at the end because I'm afraid okay. you, you've been asked the question before. So I'll tell you the question. I'm going to give you the twist. So if you were king for a day in this industry, you're the emperor. You get to change one thing about our industry and there's no ramifications from a regulatory perspective or firms or reputation or whatever. You get to change one thing about our industry. What is it? My fear is you've been asked that before. So I'm going to ask you if you, if you, if you were the emperor 20 years ago, what would you have changed? And it's maybe something that has since changed, but you wish it would have been all along or we're still not there and, and, 20 years ago would have been better and, and here we are still. So if, if you could change something going back a couple of decades, where, where are we? Uh, I would have put a rule in place back in the 1990s when we were all insurance agents and stockbrokers and decided we didn't want to be insurance agents and stockbrokers anymore and started putting financial advisor on our business card. And I would have made it illegal to do that unless you're actually in the advice business. Yep. Yep. I, I, this day, I think here we are. Right. And then now we have all the problems in, in, in present day, you know, the, uh, the industry has a really big negativity on sort of salespeople in the aggregate that I actually don't have. Like just, there is a role for salespeople selling products to fulfill needs, to take orders, to help people understand their choices when they want to buy a product, but they're not sure which one to buy. That's a meaningful, valuable service, and it's good to have out there for people. But we create all sorts of problems for the industry, and I think ultimately consumer harm, when salespeople are allowed to hold themselves out as being in the advice business, when in reality, they're in the sales business, right? We, uh, drug companies don't get to run their own clinics that sell their drugs, in fact, you can't even buy their drugs from them. You have to get them prescribed through a third-party doctor because we figured out a long time ago that like there's a lot of bad problems that come if uh, the product manufacturers actually employ their own advisors. Uh, you know, When I go to a nutritionist, they don't run a butcher shop. And I don't rely on them for objective red meat advice because if you run a butcher shop, I know that everything is going to be a recommendation for red meat at the end of the day because you run a butcher shop. Yeah. So I like that they're a butcher shop. Sometimes I want to get a nice cut of meat. I love my meat. I might even take the meat against the advice of my nutritionist. But I want to be really clear when I'm engaging my butcher and when I'm engaging my nutritionist because they have different roles and purposes. And there's a lot of problems that when they get mixed together. And to me, the, the fundamental challenge that our industry has right now is that uh, – the sales side of the industry uses the advisor title while the advisor side of the industry uses the advisor title. Consumers can't tell the difference between the, not even just the good and bad advisors, but who's actually an advisor and who and who's just operating as a salesperson. 
The regulators can't figure it out, which is why we keep doing all these regulatory contortions, Reg BI, DOL fiduciary. Like it all comes back to the fact that the regulators are saying, oh, wait, there used to be salespeople and advisors. Now they're all in one bucket. Well, we have to figure out how to regulate y'all now that you're doing the same thing. And I'm actually very much against all of these uniform fiduciary regulations that have been coming out, which are essentially saying, if all the brokerage and insurance companies are calling themselves advisors, we're just going to regulate them all as advisors. No. Because it does actually screw up some very important things that brokerage companies and insurance companies do that just are not fiduciary advice activities. Like sometimes you want to buy a product and you need someone to sell it to you. And like, we're all clear. This is not fiduciary advice. Like I do know when I go to the clothing store and the rep says that the pants look good on me. Like I do understand the nature of this relationship. I'm not actually going to you for fashion advice, but it is helpful for you to have help me understand like my choices of the clothes that are on the rack. So there is a meaningful value that salespeople provide in that context. And I and I think it's very problematic that we're trying to regulate them all as advisors. But it's because we lost the fundamental distinction between advisors versus salespeople. And, and I think we need it back. And so, you know, so my answer to both like, what would I change today? I would put that line back in between advisors and salespeople and just say, look, look, if you're going to put advisor on your business card, you're a fiduciary through and through, you're subject to all of those standards, you're subject to all the compensation restrictions that go with it, period. No ifs, ands, or buts, and no removing the hat. And if you don't want to be that, that's totally fine. Put insurance agent or stockbroker on your business card and go do insurance agent and stockbroker things. And we're all clear about the nature and scope of this relationship and 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 do your thing. Uh, but you know, what I would change today is to put that line in place. And what I would change in the past is prevent that line from having gotten blurred the way that it did over the past 20 to 30 years. And um, let's hope 20 years from now, that question's not still uh, yes. un unaddressed, but uh, good, good perspective. I love the analogies, the butcher analogy and everything. That's, uh, that's great analogy. So, so uh, appreciate you sharing that. Speaking of predictions, uh, Question number four, you've been known to make some predictions in your time, uh, which I applaud you for. A lot of people don't want to make predictions or they make them so vague, you know, to a market strategist says the market's going to go up hard stop. That's all they say. Well, oh, yeah. It's mar market strategist speak. Never give a price and a date in the same a, prediction. Yeah. Yep. As long as you, you got a job security, as long as you don't do that. Uh, uh -huh. You have gone on record with never on example. Yeah. Heck, it's probably been 10 years from 10 years ago now. The When Robo Advisors came out, you were early in the game and said, you know, all these people, all this is going to put financial advisors out of business. You were quick to say that's not at all what's going to happen. It's just going to oh, make I mean, we. We we wrote they were DIY solutions whose primary competitors were Vanguard and Schwab. And then literally three years later, the first two people to launch competing services were Vanguard and Schwab. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it it uh I think that obviously bore out. You've made a bunch yeah. of predictions. So the number four, I'm not asking you to make a prediction for, for next year or this coming okay. year. I want you to look out and say, what do you think the RIA model will look like 30 years out from now? Will it be fundamentally different from what it is now? Will it just be marginally different if you had to? And by the way, you and I will long since be retired in 30 years so that yeah. no, no one's going to uh, fact check this. But but what do you well, think? Well, I might, I might still be around health willing. I'm, 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 I'm going to be one of those uh, uh, die with my boots on types. Okay. Um, so... So ironically, I would actually say that I think much of the RA landscape is actually going to look surprisingly similar in 30 years to what it does today, with sort of a couple of big asterisks to that I have to qualify. So for much of the past 20 to 30 years, RAs were kind of this unique breed relative to the rest of the industry. They were sort of the proverbial pioneers who left big firms and supported environments and went out into the wilderness, staked some ground, cut it down, built their log cabins with their own two hands in about the most like pioneering of analogies that you can get, right? That was the RIA space for much of the past 20 to 30 years. In some ways, that's sort of how the RIA space is still portrayed, right? This is like where the pioneering entrepreneurs go. But I see an RA space that's very much different in flux. So I look at the RA space today. I still see some of those folks doing their thing, more power to them. But I see 
the rise of a whole slew of support platforms and infrastructure that's emerging around them. I see, uh, you know, the dynasties of the world. We do a version of the SIDX by planning network where, you know, we'll give you the compliance and the technology and the practice management support and all the rest around your firm. So you don't have to be totally alone. You see the rise of super OSJ models supporting increasingly independent RIAs out of the broker dealer channel. You see whole brokerage firms like Commonwealth that are basically framing themselves as national independent RIA platforms, comma with the legacy broker dealer attached uh, and, and repositioning their whole business. And at the same time, I see mega RAs rolling up, creating employee roles where the firm brings in clients and provides them to the advisors to service. And so I look at this, I'm like, cool. So we got national scale independent RIA platforms. That's what the broker dealers used to be. We've got a uh, growing national scale employee model RIAs. Okay, well, that's like the Ameriprises, Raymond James, and the rest that have employee models. We've got some mega RAs that are going after the ultra high net worth and bringing in a diverse range of banking and other services. Okay, that's basically reinventing wirehouses. And to me, like the whole landscape of all the different channels of advisors that we've had, that of which RA used to just be one because we had RA, independent broker dealer, employee model, national wirehouse. Every single one of those is being reinvented in an RIA package. So you can be your solo, you can be your affiliate, you can be your tie-in, you can be your tuck-in, you can be your employee model. Because really, to me, all it comes down to is we've got a framework that, look, there's some advisors that just want to do their entire thing autonomously. There are advisors who just want to work at a firm where it all works out of the gates and they can just see their clients and not have to worry about anything else. There are folks in the middle that want to have various affiliation packages. And to me, like the RA model is just reinventing its flavor on all of those structures that have existed for almost a hundred years. And so when I look 30 years forward into the future, I'm like, what does the future look like? We're going to have big RAs and we're going to have small RAs and we're going to have independent models. We're going to have affiliate models. We're going to have employee models. We're going to have self-employed models, which is basically all the things that we have today because human beings are just wonderfully varied. Advisors are wonderfully varied. Some of us want each of those things across the spectrum and the space is so darn large we can support all of those. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't, I, aside from the fact that some of those options have not been as available in RA format in the past, we had to get them from the wires and the IBDs and such. And now we're increasingly having them with an RA wrapper. I don't think the space actually looks that different because that's just the representation of the landscape of what consumers want. Some people want to be in big firms. Some people want to work with small firms. Some people want close touch. Some people want national brands. And as advisors, we all have choices and preferences about affiliating across that spectrum as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, I think it's just going to continue to evolve, and and kind of exactly how much it evolves. But uh, it's the trend, and I don't I don't think the trend's going to reverse anytime soon. Yeah, I mean the the striking thing for me for it is just all this discussion right now of. You have to be huge to survive. You have to have scale to survive. The solo R, the solo advisor, the solo RAA is doomed. And to me, like it's it's just comical that on the one hand, like you know, the mega RAAs that have 10, 20 billion dollars under management are one one hundredth the size of one wirehouse. Yeah. So if you need scale to survive. Uh, the entire channel is screwed up, down, left, right, and sideways. Like every RIA in the aggregate, all of them are about the size of Merrill Morgan, Wells, and UBS. Yeah, four wirehouses is the same as like thirty thousand RIAs. So, except we're split across thirty thousand. So, if you actually needed scale to survive, all of us are doomed. Now, the secondary irony to me of that is like the RIA was born from anti-scaling. Like 25 years ago, wirehouses dominated the landscape even more than they do today. RAs had no size, no scale, no systems, no infrastructure, no technology providers, no service providers, no nothing to provide a, a scale in any way, shape or form. And they're the most thriving channel for 20 consecutive years. So 
why that would suddenly be different now that there is more systems, more support, more service, more infrastructure, and more capabilities than there ever have been at any point in the past just blows my mind. Like there has never been an economically better time to be a solo practice than there is today. When I started, like you didn't even talk about going solo RA unless you had 50 to a hundred million dollars. Then it was 40 million. Then it was 30 million. That was 20 million. Then it was 10 million. Like the majority of advisors we see that start with XY Play Network, like they have no clients, no assets and $10,000 in the bank. And they start a firm and it grows. And so to me, just they're, they're the, I think like the, the biggest thing that is sort of, I, I'd be like ironically misunderstood in our space, particularly around RIAs is RIAs were literally born from the fact that you don't need scale to compete. They grew because you don't need scale to compete. They have more systems, tech, and infrastructure and service providers around them now to provide scalable external support without needing to scale yourself than at any point in the past 20 years when we already had all the growth and success to get to where we are today. And even the biggest RAs aren't vaguely, remotely, slightly close to actual national scale companies like wirehouses. Yeah. So- I mean, to me, just like the opportunities are phenomenal in the independent space right now. But to me, just the, the most persistent myth is that you need size scale to survive and you you just don't. It does help, though, to have infrastructure to plug into. And a few of us like to build our cabins with our own two hands and we'll do that. But to me, the biggest thing that's shifting and, and you live this very well on your platform, Brad, is all the different choices that are out there now for people that don't quite want to be entirely from scratch and want to attach to some systems that give them some of those scale, but that just makes it easier to run this model. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, so I think the safe 30 year prediction uh, as an example is that the $50 million RA will absolutely still be around uh, 30 years from now. Just oh, even more efficient than it is today. Yeah. I mean, even, even more efficient and high income, right? Like I, 20 years ago when I was getting going, I spent a couple of years in a firm that was um, uh, three producers, about 1.3 million in GDC, 13 person team to support that firm. Yeah. Today, those three advisors would probably need like two or three support staff. Like the back end office staffing needs are down by about 70 to 80%. I mean, we had a woman whose sole job was to take all the mail that came in every day, open all the envelopes with the duplicate paper statements that came in and file them in each client's individual paper yeah. file folder so that we could do all of our regulatory compliance documentation. Yeah. That's all electronic and automated. Like that was a full-time job. Yeah. She had a full-time job doing that. We got that much mail because we were 1.3 million GDC with many, many hundreds of clients. It was a lot of mail that came in. Someone had to open the envelopes every day because we couldn't accidentally sit on a paper check for more than 24 yeah, hours. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, all that stuff's vanished. Like we were so ludicrously inefficient back then. And it, like, well, it's interesting because 30 years from now, there'll be things we're looking back on today and which uh -huh. are kind of normal for us would be like, and I don't know what that would be, man. You had to check your inbox every single day, all day long. Your email inbox. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that won't be a thing. You know, thirty yeah, years like, from now. So we. You we had to call your client, see how you're doing. Your cybernetic, <laughs> your cybernetic, uh, 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 brain implant didn't just communicate it to you automatically. Yeah. Like, yeah. geez, that seems so inefficient. Where was yeah. your optical overlay with their background information when you were doing your discovery meeting? You had to just ask them questions. That's awful. Yeah. Yeah. Write it all down and yeah, yeah. Enter in the enter in the CRM. Yeah. yeah. Uh all right. Uh to keep us moving. Number five. Uh, you are obviously no stranger to industry conferences. Uh, you told me the other week how many dozens you do kind of on on average every year. And and, and, and as impressive as this number is used to do even more. So a mainstay, of course, at industry conferences for decades now are, are mutual fund wholesalers. They've they've been around forever. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I first started going to industry conferences a little over 20 years ago, I think, uh, and I, don't want, I don't know if glamorous is the right job, but it was a job that they seemed to be quite happy with. Uh, the yeah. wholesalers, they, they made good money. I think uh, the business was not easy. They had to travel a lot, but it was kind of receptive. And and I think that's that job has got 
significantly way more difficult, whether too many people calling on advisors, trying to pitch things, shift to ETFs, whatever the case is. So out of curiosity, if you were hypothetically a mutual fund wholesaler, and for some of those that might be listening, how, how would you best try to work with RIAs nowadays to, to, to be able to build a relationship or what, what would the expectation be from an RA to even take a phone call kind of thing? Oh, if, if, First of all, I mean, my, possible, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, my heart goes out to you guys that are, that are, that are in that position. It, it, it is rough. I mean, like I look, I'll say it from the advisor end, like 10 to 20 emails a week from wholesalers. No joke. I mean, like I, yeah. I get so many, I, I couldn't possibly take the time to politely decline to everyone because it would take me a few hours a week, even if I just spent like five minutes per email to like politely say, I'm sorry, I'm not interested uh the the volume is is sort of unimaginably overwhelming and just practically speaking in the modern world of what we do as advisors like if i'm looking for a solution i'll call you like i don't really need to you know i don't i don't develop my systematized models for my clients with random phone calls and email solicitations that come in like, i mean no offense to the folks that are in the position of try to get their foot in the door but like that's just not how it works now. Like yeah. I will form an investment thesis of what I want to go after. I will do my investment research and due diligence. I will get down to a short list. And if your company is on that short list, I will call you. And if I you're on the short list, I call you. I expect you to know absolutely everything there is to possibly know about your product. It's but short of that, I'm probably not even that interested in talking to you. Right? I mean, it's sort of the practical, practical reality. So for folks that are trying to sort of get their foot in the door or make the difference. Like, so here's, here's what I would say. Um, number one, really, really, really know your products cold and everything I could possibly know about them because I don't need you to be my call router. If I'm calling you and you'll say like, Oh, I'll get you that answer. Uh, let me, let me get the resources internally. All I'm thinking as an advisor is, Cool. Can you also just give me their number so next time I don't have to call you? Like, yeah. I don't I don't need you to be my call router. If I'm calling you, I expect you to be the answer person. So, how well do you know your products and solutions to really be able to talk? So, if I do call and I want to have that conversation, you can talk shop. And still today, like one of my good friends in the in the industry is someone that I got to know 20 years ago when he was a wholesaler calling on our office and I spent time with him because he knew this was in the annuity days. He knew everything there was to know about his annuity contract. He know all the like fine print stuff. Cause he'd actually read the prospectus that nobody reads. He read his own prospectus that sadly no one reads and I read prospectuses. So I could actually ask him hard questions about the prospectus and he knew. And not only had he read his own prospectus and knew he'd read everybody else's prospectuses. He knew all the fine point details of every competitor. And not just cause he was like, sniping at them he can even acknowledge like yeah they're better than us in this area but we're better than them in in that area he was the most knowledgeable person in that space and so anytime i had a question i called him because i knew he was a resource he was a real resource he was the resource he wasn't just connecting me to resources in his firm so number one i i I would say is is an opportunity to be there because then i really know you and trust you when i do need to call i really do want to call you because i know i'm going to get the information and the answers that i need the the second thing that i would say is just realistically to differentiate in this environment today the number two thing i still hear and see i feel it myself and see it for all of my advisor friends if i'm not asking you about products I'm asking you what other advisors do. Because one of the things I know about all of you in the wholesaling world is you, you see more of us than we see of each other. So I want to know and understand, like I want you to teach me about what other people are doing that's successful that I might be able to bring to my practice. The asterisk to that is most wholesalers I find don't really actually understand how advisory firms work and what our pain points really are. So they come with the wrong ideas. They come with the wrong stories. They come with the things that are about 
sales strategies to sell their product, not solve my actual problems in my business. That would help me grow. And if I grow, then I might actually use your product when I gather more assets and grow. But those, that's not my primary problem now. My primary problem is other things. Uh, a lot of wholesalers, I find, put us in too many big, broad buckets around, oh, we must have these problems because we're in this firm or we're this type or we're this channel. Most of our problems are not are not determined by channel. It's determined by the size of the practice, how many team members we have, which dictates a whole lot of management related and infrastructure issues, how many clients I have, which dictates my busy work, my ratios of revenue to clients and revenue to staff and clients to staff, which speaks to how service intensive I am or am not. And so that that to me becomes the second opportunity. So this industry saying goes like, you can talk to advisors about practice management and it's a plus. And I do believe that's true, but I really, really do believe that's true. But most wholesalers don't understand enough of the differences between our practices and where our pain points actually are. And so we get tips and advice that doesn't actually really relevant. Yeah. And I think that's great advice. And, uh, you know, that's one of those, it's, it's the long game. You, you can yeah. try to become that expert and whatever that, that doesn't immediately turn into business the next day. You have to demonstrate that. And it often takes years to build that, that reputation, but, but there's no other way. Right. So I, yeah. I think that's good and, advice. And the third thing I will just note quickly from a very practical perspective, um, because our product decisions increasingly in the disadvisor world, first and foremost, come down to I do my research and due diligence and and, and I'm going to find you. Um, pick a company that's got a sol an actually solid lineup. You know, I, I, I've i met a lot of wholesalers over the years like, dude, you are really good at what you do and you know your space well. But my friend, you are representing a company that just probably doesn't have a snowball's chance. And for some of you, just you, you know who you are. I'm not going to call it any companies in particular, uh, but just uh, some products are a lot more competitive than others. And if you're, if you're repping a, just my like friendly, my advice I would give my wholesaler friend friends when I hang out with them, like if it's that hard getting your foot in the door and building relationships with advisors, because the, the company just doesn't have a great lineup spend less time trying to figure out how to get your foot in the door with advisors anyways, and more time trying to figure out how to find a better company to represent. Just yeah. that will give you a better shot and better conversation. Do you still have to be awesome in all the things that I said to create the rapport and the connection when the advisor calls or when you can make the breakthrough? But uh, I do see a lot of wholesalers that just my like career advice would be less time trying to figure out how to sell your not very saleable thing and more time trying to figure out how to work for a different company that has something that's more saleable in the first place. And that's good advice. And that's going to be hard for some folks to. I I know like on, but... that's easy to say and very hard to do for lots of family and lifestyle change and income change and territory yeah. change and lineup change and all sorts of other things. But you know, the, the, uh, if it, it was easy, it wouldn't be hard work that pays well. And and eventually you're going to die off with the wrong product. So you might as well yeah. shift course kind of thing. So, all right, good, good advice. Thank you for that. Uh, number six, we're almost done here. Number six, um, and this is going to be another kind of hypothetical. So you don't need to worry yeah. about, oh, well, Michael Kitsis is the one that did this. If you were given $100 million, maybe some rich person came to you and said, Michael, here's $100 million. I want you to invest this in the RIA industry for me. Where are you putting that kind of money to work? Ooh. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep Where keep would going. I? Wow. Where would I deploy $100 million into the RIA industry? Um, two, two, just so two thoughts to me that, that come off hand. One, um, there's a lot of newer small technology companies starting to crop up that are building some really cool new things for advisors to solve really meaningful challenges in our businesses. And just from a pure investor end, I think there's a lot of money to be made in investing to some advisor tech startups. Uh, advisor tech in our space does not get a lot of love because when you pitch this to like a venture capital firm, they see like there's 300,000 advisors. There's 300 million people in the country. 
Why are you selling to advisors? Make this direct to consumers, sell it to a bajillion people. Yeah. And they, they try to talk advisor tech companies out of building for advisors uh, because just the consumer marketplace is so much larger. Problem is consumer marketplace is really hard not to crack and they don't like paying for money. Whereas advisors run businesses and have certain business needs they need to pay for. So there's actually a lot of opportunity in the advisor tech space. But number one, I would say is I would I'd be looking hard at some advisor tech companies to be investing into. And number two is... Uh, I would be trying to find advisory firms that have organic growth engines and take a minority stake in them and buy a piece of them and give them some cash to do the organic growth marketing thing they're doing and just pour more fuel on the fire. Uh, but most capital that's coming in today is going into firms that just buy other firms. They don't really have an organic growth machine. So using the money they get to buy other firms which is not particularly cost efficient, capital intensive, and you don't really create enterprise value by just like mashing a bunch of things together. I would be hunting for the subset of advisors that have actually figured out a marketing pipeline. They know who they're going after. They know how they reach them. They've got a process of marketing, nurturing, and sales. And I'd be plowing a lot of money into them because uh, the economics of advisory firms that have good organic growth engines are just ludicrously, insanely profitable. Uh, you know, a, a single million dollar client at a 30% profit margin, $10,000 a year of revenue at 1%, $3,000 of uh, profit on the client at a 30% profit margin. Most of us have 95% plus retention rates. Yeah. So 20 year average tenure. It's like one client's could be sixty thousand dollars of profits. Now, I don't say that lightly. You gotta like work your backside off for 20 years to actually get and keep that client. Yeah. But one client is sixty thousand dollars of lifetime profits. So if you've got a systematized marketing process where you can spend thousands of dollars to get one client, but you can spend thousands of dollars to get one client, if I if it costs you three to five thousand dollars to get one of those clients. My long-term ROI is just ginormous. So I would be looking for those investment opportunities. Okay. I like it. I remember you had a guy, and unfortunately I forgot his name on the podcast, your, your podcast a while back. And he uh, he's no longer with the firm. But I remember he was a marketing guy and like the stories he told, I, I forgot what it was. They, they got it down to like bird watchers are good clients and they would market specifically to them. And it, it shows you if you really look at the science behind it. So, but yes. easier said than done to be able to pull that off and then of course find those folks. But uh, yes. most of us cast too wide of a net trying to be interesting to everyone and don't attract anyone in the process. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Final of the seven questions. Yes. Um, uh, and then we'll, then we'll, we'll go to the scorecard here shortly, but uh, there's uh, at a podcast out there. I don't know if you've heard of it, but maybe some of the folks listen, it's called my first millions podcast. Okay. Great podcast. I don't have anything to do with it. So I'm not giving a plug. But it's two guys that are both successful in their own right, have started businesses, okay. have, have, have built up a good amount of, uh, of uh, wealth as a result. And they love talking about other businesses that they think should be started. They just don't have the capacity or desire to do it themselves, but they think it, it should be done. So potentially with some uh, entrepreneurs that are listening along or aspiring fintech folks, is there anything in our industry that if you if your hands weren't as full as they are and you had more capacity, you, you might even tackle it yourself. It's not going to happen because you don't, that you wish someone would and, and go ahead and maybe share it out there and someone might hear this and run with it. Man, I my my thought goes back to to where we just were. The this um the economics of advisory firms growing clients, like spending money to get clients is so ludicrously profitable in the long run. To me, there's so, so much opportunity to just pick a target market you can go after that's, you know, sizable enough you can build and scale a bit on and just get hyper-focused in the marketing for them and go at it. Like as, as excited as I am about a bunch of the the different businesses are out there that that support and build infrastructure around advisory firms. 
the darn advisory business is still more profitable than all of them. <laughs> like it's the 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 advisory firms are more profitable than all the support structures we're building around them. Uh, but so many firms struggle because we try to be everything to everyone because we were trained in a world where you just work with anybody who can afford your products or services instead of really getting clear on target markets and pursuing them the way that that like businesses classically get built with with strong business plans. And as crowded as the advisor space is, I think there's still huge gaping opportunities to go after particular client segments. Um, young doctors, young lawyers, rising architects, um, people making partner at the firm. Like just there, there's so many. You know, I, um, it's an advisor I know in in Indiana. You know his his niche specializations are ophthalmologists that run independent practices who are within five years of retiring and thinking about selling to a PE roll-up. Wow. Just that. Yeah. <laughs> Good for him. And he's got more flow that he can handle, a waiting list, the number one podcast for independent ophthalmologists. And every time one of them gets a call from one of the roll-up firms, because they got apparently a roll-up thing going on in their space, the way that we do in our, in our RIA space, He's the guy to call. He's the go-to. He is the good. I I that hits near and dear to my heart. You've you've been kind of messaging that for a long time. The niche. I know you say a lot of that yep. X Y, and uh, a lot of that went into the vision for what I created with my firm of of just being hyper focused on on one thing yeah. uh, myself. So I yeah, you're living it near near and dear to my heart, and and I would agree. It just makes it ten times easier for how you market your services the time you can spend on being an expert on something. So uh, I think that's yeah. wonderful, I mean, wonderful the, advice. In the purest sense, if if you can figure out a systematized method to spend three to $5,000 to get a million dollar clients that you can do repeatedly, you are minting millions. Just do that system and repeat it and scale it up with more people. You know, you're taking, you're spending three to $5,000 for something that is $60,000 a lifetime client profit. The, the numbers are just off the page good. I mean, that's why so much PE money is pouring into our space. Yeah. The, the numbers are so off the charts good. But very few of us even approach with the mentality of, I'm going to try to build a scalable business with a client acquisition costs under $3,000 for a target market with more than $10,000 of revenue per client. Like that's the that's the business economics framing of it. So you got to get clear on what those KPIs are to, to to build it that way. But nobody's really building that. And the numbers are just absurdly good. Well, I, I hope it has influenced someone listening to yeah. this to, uh, or hopefully multiple people yeah. to uh, be motivated to pursue that path. Because I, again, I agree with you 100%. So uh, thanks for sharing that. And um, be before we go to the scorecard, I do have a bonus Michael Kitz's trivia question for you. Okay. Uh, in case I didn't go seven for seven, which I want you to be honest if I didn't, if I didn't, but the bonus might give me an extra point. So this is a Michael Kitz's okay. trivia question. Okay. I'll take you back to November 6, 2007. Okay. I don't know if that name if that date rings the bell, but if it doesn't, or for the listeners that that don't know, that was the day that the Kitz's blog went live, the very mm -hmm. first post. So originally, I was going to ask you, what was the very first blog post you made? I went back and looked. Turns out you made two on that day. The first one was a welcome to the new blog kind of general thing. So that that's that's too much of a softball for you. So I'm not going to ask you that. So I want to know, what was the subject of your very essentially first blog post of your, your blog beyond just that welcome one. Do, oh, I, I know what it is. I looked it up. Do you know what it is? No, no look into yourself. It, it, it would have been like back then I was super deep into um, taxes and retirement tax law. So it would have been some like revenue ruling or IRS notice or private letter ruling that came out. Cause my challenge at the time was I had started publishing our newsletter, the Kitsis report, where it was these like long form uh, articles on continuing education, like big, like white papers, like 10, 15 page white papers. And I had this stuff that I was researching around tax law. Uh, and like, I wanted to write about it. I needed a place to put it, but it wasn't long enough to fill a newsletter. Or it wasn't long enough to fill a white paper. So the original version of the blog was like, I needed a place to put all these old, like 
tax notices and revenue rulings that were coming out. So I'm I'm going to guess it would have been one of those, but I I don't know. I don't know what it would have actually uh I don't know what it would have actually been at the time. I want to say like a bunch of the um uh uh there was a bunch of changes going on with pension protection act and like non-spouse beneficiary rollovers and a whole bunch of stuff on that. So I would guess it was something tied to that, but like I don't really remember quite which revenue rulings came out when. Uh, I'm just trying to remember like 07 th- relative to Pension Protection Act 2006. With assume I don't know what the total posts are. I assume it's in the thousands now. So I just asked you to go back thousands of posts, and at the very end there, you actually nailed it perfectly. <laughs> it was some IRS changes around non-spouse beneficiary rollover rules. Oh, there we go. It uh, was your very first. And I give you credit. You, you didn't come out soft. It was a very wonky, detailed topic that you dove into Ooh. on that very first uh, post. So I, I did not think you would remember that uh, that wow. detail. So, so that's I, only because I like if you asked me anything like six to 12 months after that, I would have been stuck. That was a lucky moment in time because. That was post pension protection act. Like I remember what I was stuck on then when I launched the blog. Yeah, well, I, I, amazing. I did not think you would get awesome. the, the Michael Kitts's trivia question. You you got it. So, uh, so with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you for your for your, all your time. But to, to for the scorecard, how did we do? Out of seven, did, did uh, how many do you think was your first go at it? You were you were original on six out of seven. Okay. So, ah. Uh, I have ha- I have had a couple of conversations over the years with wholesalers in the wholesaling community about like mm-hmm. other other pathways to try to get the door open with financial advisors. We wrote a couple of pieces about it a couple of years ago as well of kind of changing landscape. So I, I have had the co- wholesaler conversation. The rest was new. Okay, I, I should have. That was probably too broad. I, I should have seen that one coming. Okay. I think it's still good info to share, but. Fair, fair enough. I'll take my. Well, my on the other seven. angle for that is now, like, it's a bunch of wholesalers coming in the financial advisor business. That's actually one of the biggest shifts that yeah. we're, we're seeing now as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, awesome. thank you very much for your time. This has been uh, a fun conversation. Uh, I appreciate, as always, you sharing all your wisdom with everyone. And, and I appreciate you coming on to uh, be part of this show. So, uh, with that, we'll sign off. But thank you very much, Michael. My pleasure. My pleasure. Congratulations on 100. Yeah. Thank you.